Hello, welcome to my beautiful office where all the writing action generally fails to happen. Welcome to another Rahala Stapa with the wonderful Jade Adams. Uh, if you haven't heard of her yet, you're going to. She is magnificent and brilliant in this podcast. You're going to really enjoy it. Um, if you like these podcasts, please become a monthly badger. It would be a terrific way to help us make more podcasts. I'm really hopeful that in 2020, we're going to be able to do ever new and more exciting things. I've got a sitcom idea planned for audio version, and uh, we'll see how we can do, but we need to fund Rahalastapa, Rahalastapa. Go to gofasterstrike.com slash badges, become a monthly badger. You can spend £3 a month or more if you want. You get different coloured badges if you pay a bit more. You will get behind-the-scenes access to um, loads of interviews I do backstage. I do five to ten minutes with each guest backstage of extra, usually emergency questions, um, <clears throat> other little bits and pieces coming up like the stone clearing documentary and the me one versus me two snooker match lots of little extra bits will go up in there as well that we uh, keep secret from everybody else unless you back the kickstarter um you get badges you get a membership pack you get an uh, ad free audio version of the podcast if you're interested in that you will get a monthly email and uh, maybe more than monthly giving you advance warning of what f fantastic guests are coming up. We're in Birmingham, London and Norwich so far in 2020. Go to richhang.com slash gigs. No guests as yet planned. Um, there's loads of stuff you get for being a member and you get in entered into a monthly draw. I'm going to do a little video about that. I might have done already actually. Doesn't matter. Okay, I'm too far in to go back now. Ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax and enjoy with me, Richard Herring and my guest, Jade Adams. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Bristol Old Vic. You're much better than last week's audience already. They were awful. And uh, please welcome a man who's just done a number four on the Bristol stool scale. It's Richard Herring. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, love to see you. Love to see you. Thank you for coming again. Uh, welcome to Richard Herring's Long Stringy Turds podcast. It's as a theme developing. Uh, I've decided uh, that the Bristol school stool system is not thorough enough. Uh, there's no one for one if you do one that comes out like string, does it? That's, that's, where's that on the scale? And there's no one if you do like one like Mr Whippy. <laughs> so every week I'll just get a different guest along. We'll talk about the different poos they've done. Try and come up with more than seven different types of poo. But uh, I was talking to Ian Tarr the other day from... Uh, <laughs> He's the bloke who came up with Tars ice cream. That's the guy who invented. He calls it Rahalas, I don't know if that's gonna. I don't know if that's gonna. Can anyone, anyone a fan of Tars ice cream in? Yeah. <laughs> that was your cue to shout out again, you idiot. Uh, anyway, I do like to look at TripAdvisor when I come to uh, towns, even when I know them well, like Bristol. And I would say one of the uh, one of the better uh, of the many fantastic tour. Do come to Bristol, people at home. It's a wonderful place. People are lovely here. Uh, and uh, generally, what they, I was, we were talking backstage to the comics and uh, just saying what a, a fantastic audience you, all, you always are here. And I'm not being patronising, I mean it. Uh, thank you for coming to my shows. I love you. I have just been in Leicester, so I've got kind of uh, <laughs> Stockholm Syndrome or something. But it's <laughs> reverse. Um, where the people are all right. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were nice. I'm only kidding, Lester. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> give our bones back. I can't let it go. <laughs> Those belong to York. Um, uh, SS Great Britain is a lovely tourist attraction. Have you, have you been to SS Great Britain, Bristol? Yeah. yeah not, I, uh, I don't know. If, I think I did when I first moved. It's been there a while. Uh, I like to look at the uh, one-star reviews on TripAdvisor. Uh, this is one for the marvellous SS Great Britain. Incredible historic ship. My son was on a school trip in there. Hi said, it said instead of he, but hi. Hi said that it was a horrible trip. Very loud that sound from the speakers. Sam was like, example, killing animals. <laughs> in the kitchen was lots of blood on the walls and heads of animals. That is all what he remembers from the trip. <laughs> I'm not sure that guy went to the SSC. <laughs> 
I don't remember that, but is there an animal, is there blood on the walls? I mean, I want to go. I mean, it might just been a terrible day at the SS Great Britain. He might just been a terrible guest. So anyway, so uh, we'll move on because we've got a fabulous guest this week. It can't be a tame week because I'm a different clothes. <laughs> how, how would that work? How would that even work? Uh, she's probably best known for being the only comedian in the world to play the Royal Albert Hall and my village hall on the same day. <laughs> she did last week. Oh, my goodness. I'm, luckily, I know her name or I wouldn't be able to tell you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... <laughs> It's Jane Adams! Hello, come in, sit down. Thank you for my mic. Oh. Hello, my lover. How are you doing? Are you all right? I'm all right, mate. How are you? I'm very good. I'm so, we were discussing backstage how I've come to the West Country and very slowly my voice is getting more West Country as I, as I do the podcast. Uh, so I'll try and go back to my, you know, proper voice. <laughs> like a proper I, non-comedy ridiculous let's voice. Let's hear your West Country okay. accent. Oh, my lover, how are you doing? What is I that? Hello? <laughs> Hello? What, you, I'll, we, I'm from Brittle. Not, that's I'm not, from Brizzle. Brittle? Brizzle. No, we don't even say Bristol. We say Bristol, don't we? Yes. They all do these things that we say and we don't say them at all, do we? Like, everyone says to me, oh, Gert Lush. I've never said it in my fucking life. <laughs> no, I don't need to say that. I just say stuff and it sounds funny, doesn't it? But yeah, <laughs> people, um, they always, with the, with, the, with the West Country accent, there's always this idea that we, we sound like we've been, like, you know, finding apples and, like, tipping cows over and stuff. Yeah. But I'm from the city, mate. Like, I'm hard, yeah. you know? <laughs> There's no farmer Giles in here, mate, at all. I am rough as they come. Yeah, good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, let's talk about it. You did a gig, uh, you very kindly came and did a charity gig for my local nursery. I loved it. Um, in, in my village hall. Ah, but you came from the Royal Albert Hall and then went back to the Royal Albert Hall in between. And I live in uh, Hertfordshire. Shall, little, I, shall I tell them the best thing about this, okay. right? <laughs> Um, Richard uh, was asked uh, by the nursery to raise money for the nursery, yet couldn't get his own kids in that nursery. <laughs> <laughs> we got them in the nursery, but then we couldn't get them into oh, the primary school. you couldn't get school. them into the primary yeah, school, so that we was have, it, we, yeah. have to, we, go, we have to send our kids to the next village to the primary school, so there isn't room for them. Yeah, they so were we like, are raising money for the school that we're not going to send our kids to. They wanted some of that sweet they were all happy. They were all happy to take the money, weren't they? Yeah, they wanted that money, didn't they? They were really nice, and we it went over nice. your house. Yeah. And uh, my chap and I, he's another comedian, we had uh, your, your wife's lamb tagine, whatever that was, yeah. mate. We had, I, I had lamb for three days straight after that. <laughs> I, got, I, I, get, I, I have that type of personality that if I like something enough, yeah. then I'll repeat it until I don't like it anymore. Um, I did it with the song Streets of Philadelphia by Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> I've said this before on another podcast, but I'll say it again. We travelled uh, on a coach from here, Bristol, from my school, St. Mary Redcliffe and Temple School. Any, any in? Any? Are you in? Yeah. Did I, were you, what years? Uh, Class of 1996, what were you? Late than that. Late. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very, a very young fan base. A very, a very young. I, I can tell. <laughs> but we travelled from that school on a coach all the way to Germany <laughs> and on the way back I found that someone played it when I was in Germany and on the way back I listened to that song right. on repeat but it was back in a time when I had a Walkman yeah. so I was like I wasn't like I was just pressing a button and it was flipping back electronically I was having to rewind <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah so uh, <laughs> no, I bought no. my first Walkman here in Bristol with my first week's wages from the mushroom farm did we talk about this in the last <laughs> no. one? I've done that quite recently up in, where, where, I think probably Curry's or somewhere I bought it from. 30 quid, I got 30 quid pay packet for the first week in the mushroom farm. Didn't give any to my parents for rent, obviously. And bought a Walkman with it for 30 pounds. Mushrooms, eh? Yeah, picking mushrooms. Ax what? Axbridge Mushroom Farm. Not, Not there anymore, don't look for it. <laughs> I think Yeo Valley uh, Yogurt's made there now. I'm from Bristol, mate. What yeah. sort of mushrooms are we talking? Uh, they're normal, proper mushrooms. Proper. It, <laughs> well, yeah, the, well, there are some normal, proper mushrooms. Button mushrooms. Uh, button mushrooms. Yeah. Oh, okay, nice. Lovely. That's yeah. sweet. Yeah, it was yeah. nice. I wasn't very good at it. I, only, I only lasted two weeks, but I got a Walkman out of it. Did you? Yeah. Do you, and where were the mushrooms growing? In, like, um, beds inside a big, far, in, like, in a big container building. Oh, OK. Yeah. You weren't just farming. Went out in the woods just picking mushrooms, hoping for the best. Down the forest of Dean. Because <laughs> <Just. laughs> if I'd been picking the mushrooms just in the wild, everyone would be dead who ate them. I guess. <laughs> yeah, that looks like it's probably OK. 
um, yeah, so well, thank you for doing that gig. Um, but it's it quite a, a, di a difference between the Royal Albert Hall. What was it like when you went back? You were doing a big thing with the Guilty Feminist, were you? At the, so uh, the Guilty Feminist was uh, doing a sort of BBC Proms does the Guilty Feminist thing, and I went on and co-hosted with Deborah yeah. Francis White, which was really lovely. And we had Jamie Barton, who was the opera singer, singer at the end. She sang Rule Britannia, wearing a bisexual flag, yeah. um, uh, which a lot of people were <laughs> very angry about, which, <laughs> which is what I loved about it. <laughs> People get. I, I don't care what people want to do. You can you can you can do whatever you like to make yourself successful. What go for it. But I just find it hilarious that people get so annoyed about. It. Yeah. I think the world's never been funnier. <laughs> <laughs> What's on a bisexual flag though? For is it a, what, a cock and a fanny? I don't or know. It? <laughs> it's a cock and a fanny. Yeah. I, I just mean... with a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> but... I mean, are we? I mean, to be honest with you, like I could say. I mean, I you know, <laughs> I, I'm I'm I'm. I, I, I wouldn't say I'm a bisexual. I'm currently with a bloke, yeah. but I, you know, I'm university. <laughs> <laughs> I had some Stella once. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get the flag though? You got to get the flag if you've done flag, it. You gotta, mate. If I'd done it, I'd be waving. I've kissed a man. I can't have the flag for kiss, kiss just snogging a bloke, can I? You snogged a man. I snogged a bloke. Have you? Yeah. When did you? Do oh yeah. When, when did I was you? a student, got to do it. Did you? This is saucy. It is nice. We've we just been, had a little saucy moment. We've been moment sexy there, backstage. So. Just getting the two of us. Yeah. Away from home? Oh, you know, you're back at home. <laughs> Can I come round to your mum's? I'm in the worst bit of home as well. I'm with my parents, the most unsexy building in the whole of the world. <laughs> Although I did lose my virginity in it. Did so. you? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't lose my virginity in my parents' home. I didn't lose my virginity until about two years. No, it was a year since I... Well, no, it was two years. I had a year off. Didn't lose my virginity on my gap year. Oh, God. That's pretty... <laughs> I bet that was all you were thinking about <laughs> before your gap year, which is... Bit, and I lost yeah, my virginity at the end of the first year of university. That's pretty bad, isn't it? I was, I was practically 20. That's all right. It's I all don't right. think that's a bad age. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're saying bad. at the moment that statistically, like, no one's fucking anymore. I mean, that's not how they're saying it, yeah. but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was written in The Guardian, guys. <laughs> Um, but no one's having sex anymore, so actually that's kind of, um, yeah. it's very uh, but this was modern in, of you. this was in the 1980s when everyone was yeah. at it. There's, yeah. It was the heyday for AIDS. Everyone was, everyone had AIDS. <laughs> no, I... It, I, was, it was amazing. I was, I was talking, I was talking... It was proper AIDS. It would kill you in those days. <laughs> Not like the AIDS they have now. I, I am, I was literally talking about AIDS today on the motorway. Yeah with my, uh, my mum and my dad, because oh, yeah. we were talking about Freddie Mercury, okay, yeah. and we, because the, um, it was, uh, I mean, I couldn't have had a nicer journey. There was a Celine Dion hour, and she did, um, uh, the show must go on, and I said, oh, isn't it, oh, Queen music, brilliant. And then we, st and then AIDS came up immediately. <laughs> and I was saying to my mum, like, she, I don't think she realised, she didn't understand, like, not a lot of people know about AIDS and HIV. No. But I got loads of mates who've got HIV because I'm um, um, in a sort of community of people, queer community in London. I've, a lot of drag queens sort of inspired me to do comedy and stuff. Or actually let me just come and gig for money, which you don't get in stand-up for a very long time. And yeah. I w wasn't really up for like performing to other comedians, so I sort of went off to the drag queens. But I've met lo I know loads of people with HIV. And I, like my, my John Sizzle uh, is a fantastically funny drag queen that I know. He's really funny. He's in his 50s. And uh, he was on a podcast with my chap and he said, you know, to get HIV, you've got to really go for it. <laughs> he, was like, he, he, was like, he was like, and I was really going for it. Was <laughs> <laughs> and I, I hadn't heard anyone say that before because, you know, the idea is, is that, you, you know, that's what, you know, people might think is that you can just get it like that. You don't, it's, not, yeah. it's not in every saliva gland. It's not in every, like, say you, you, you did it and yeah. the stuff came out. The likelihood that the thing is in that is yeah. very unlikely. But yeah, it's it nice is. to hear that you've got to give it a real good fucking go. Mate. Give it a go. <laughs> you've got to put some effort in. Put some, put some elbow fucking... grease in. Yeah. You really <laughs> To get your age You definitely need some grease. Also, not um, a death sentence anymore. He said to me, it's like having diabetes, babe. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you've hot-footed it over from your... You recorded a special for Amazon Prime, was it yesterday? Literally yesterday. Yeah. Like, I have a lot of... Uh, I've got a lot of amazing things happening, but there are some like milestone moments. I had a milestone moment yesterday, and I, uh, f 
for the first time, recorded my first stand-up special for Amazon Prime at the Bloomsbury Theatre with basically a thousand people, a thousand people, so 500 in each show, of basically everyone that I adore in the entire world that came. And I did the show that I took up to Edinburgh this year, The Ballad of Kylie Jenner's Old Face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I did that show and I uh, and it went it was it was the gig of my life oh, yesterday fantastic. the first one of course I did it and I was like well I don't think that went very well and everyone was like what the fuck I'm quite a, I'm quite hard on myself yeah, yeah. Um, but then the second one because I just didn't give a shit because they said you've got we've got one in the bag now so just go and really have some fun and I really didn't give a shit on the second <laughs> one and it was great and it was so well managed and there were two there were two fucking trucks outside for me. I worked in Asda. <laughs> in Bedminster. <laughs> two trucks! <laughs> I'm, only, I'm at that stage now, like, in a few years' time, I won't be able to do this because it's bragging, but right now it's, like, kind of cute, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's amazing. So when will that be, when will that be on Amazon Prime? We're hoping Christmas right. and January... Uh, so Christmas, January, but I'm, I'm hoping Christmas because everyone's fucking in and can watch it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a great show. We saw it. it was one of the few shows I, we made an effort to see in Edinburgh because we were looking after two stupid kids. There are kids. I can't blame anyone else. <laughs> we were looking after these two stupid kids. They're pretty bloody adorable. They're, They're like literal, literal, <laughs> literal, literal cherubs you, you, yeah. you, have, you have made. Yeah, if you see them for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> They're pretty, pretty good, but they're hard. it's hard work looking after those kids. Those kids. So one of, we had a night off and a babysitter and we came to see your show. Thank you. For it was I'm, awesome. I, and it was... I appreciate that. No, no. I, I know what that means. Yeah. I've got friends who are having babies and I know what it means yeah. to have a babysitter and go out and you have to choose the thing you're going to you see. You do. Thank it you. Made, me having kids made me realise I should put a bit of effort into doing my comedy because <laughs> yeah, people are coming out. <laughs> people are paying to see I thought, oh, I should actually try, try and be funny. <laughs> be embarrassed about the first 20 years. But... You know, if it's your one night out, which we know it really was, it was, but it was. I thought, I generally thought you were going to get nominated, which you probably did as well. There was, it must I have mean, been everyone was banging on about yeah, it. Yeah. Me. They were like, oh, it's going to be you, it's going to be you. And I was walking around going, I got this. <laughs> I'm going to be an absolute superstar. And then they came out and I went, oh, oh okay. <laughs> but it's so difficult. There's so many thousands of shows now, it's so difficult. It's a, it was a very assured and great show. And there was also, there was always those jokes. Uh, lists in Edinburgh and they always get things sent in they're always quite traditional puns and things yeah. there was a joke in your show you might not want to do it me want to wait and see it but, but it's the one about uh, maitre d's oh yeah, yeah. I'll do it do yeah, you okay. hear it which I think, I think should have I think should have won the joke competition because this really? is a, yeah this is a proper joke okay well I um, it's a story I tell about going to Paris where I get treated like shit uh, in a really posh restaurant because I I make a joke that I was brought up on Spam and Space Raiders and my boyfriend hadn't had mayonnaise until he was 22, so we thought we'd <laughs> change ourselves. Um, and I talk about how I, I talk about how they made me feel when I went in there. And I, I said, so it got worse because the um, maitre d' ca comes over to us. Now, if you don't know what a maitre d' is, it's basically a waiter who's still doing it in his 40s. <laughs> I think it's a great... It's a great joke. It's a great joke. I think it's your joke. It works from to the, from your character, but yeah. it's a, it's a one-liner, and it's not just a pun, pun about something, you know. Which is what they always pick as the jokes of the fringe. And then there's that furious. I, my favorite. It's my favorite part, point of the month. I don't care about anything else in Edinburgh Fringe except for when the joke of the month comes out because the uh, the amount of anger from people <laughs> who don't think it's funny. Yeah. People when they don't think it something's funny, like, can't just go, oh, I don't think that's funny. They're like, well, that's not funny. It's not, it's not, which is funny. Um, <laughs> and then the other thing is, is people that think they already wrote it. Yeah. You know, the people that lay claim to it, and then you, you get loads of, like, twi tweets of, from people in 2007 saying something very near it. Um, but all, all puns have pretty much been said yeah, yeah. before by other well, people. Well, most jokes have, you know, that's what I think, like, to come up with an original idea and line that's succinct as well. You know, it's not something I'm very good at, as these people know. Uh, <laughs> but if I come up with one thing that I consider a one-liner a year, I am made up. And I do not come up with one. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I think they're very difficult to come up with something that's original and something that works for you and doesn't work for anything else. And that's what I mean. You know, that was that's a joke that is about your character that only you would have come up with, and I don't think anyone else has ever said. But is also, you know, undermines and within the story as well undermines the guy who's making you feel bad in a in a brilliant way. Not that we need to explain it. And the minute you explain jokes, they're ruined. <laughs> 
Uh, but it's a brilliant show, and there's, there's so because it's it's looking at feminism from you know a, a working class perspective, from your perspective. And you know, you, take, you make some quite bold decisions in there, and you I'm, say, "I'm pretty like I'll be honest with you guys. I'm going to be trolled like fuck." <laughs> um, I take a little pop, a funny pop. Uh, I, 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 you know, I take the, I, you know, that's what we do. We're comedians. Yeah. I'm not a politician. I'm not there saying st statements that are going to change people's lives. I'm just saying words that are when they're put together in a certain way, they're funny, you yeah. know. And when the, with this accent and the, my gutsy chutzpah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here to entertain people. You know, we're at, like they say we're heading towards a depression. Call me fucking Mother Courage. I just wanna, uh, I just wanna <laughs> make people laugh. But I'm going to be because I like. I often feel like, and I don't know if any of you do uh, as well. I often feel like feminism is a predominantly middle class conversation mm -hmm. and excludes working class people. Which I'd be honest with you. If you're talking about victims of the patriarchy, working class women are more of a victim than middle class women, I would say. But then I would also disagree with that <laughs> and say that working class women, well, the reason I didn't understand or talk about feminism is because working class women are just in charge and <laughs> in, in their houses yeah. and in their families. So it's not a conversation you have that often. And I just thought, because you all, with Edinburgh, you, when you write a show, you want to write a show that no one else is writing, and everyone's doing feminism, um, but no one is doing feminism really from a working class perspective. And I was like, I can do that, I, you know. And I also wanted to challenge myself because the magic happens out of, outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. That's my motto. It's not. I heard it from the uh, TV show Girls. But <laughs> in fact, I stole that. That's plagiarism. Um, but it does happen outside of your comfort zone. It's an old old saying. And I wanted to do something I hadn't done before. I, there's all, often in my shows a lot of always jokes, but like songs and pizzazz and hair and big sequin costumes and this year I was like how about I go on stage in a black fucking turtleneck because the middle class people love that <laughs> and then I talk about something clever and make a make a point about something as well as trying to make people laugh and take the piss and because I feel like the thing is with comedy the funniest thing is always the taboo thing so as soon as you get like the um the right arm brigade making something taboo it becomes funny, so yeah. it's their fucking fault. Yeah. So, like, I, I do stuff, I, 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 I might take the piss out of a, a, a certain body pom positive um, supermodel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she's a DJ, an actress, and she um, does body positivity, and I and I take the piss out of it in there. But it's I, her fans are like insane. So, there's but you know, but it's but it's bold, but it's all you know that it's that. It's bold. It's well, bold. But it's bold. But it also, I, you know, people are, um, you know, it's it's it. That's what you had, people say. You're not allowed to say anything anymore, and you you know you have to be careful what you say. But you can absolutely say anything you want. You have to pick your targets carefully. The people who and and differently, and you have to be original. So the people saying that are generally saying. I want to be racist and I'm not allowed to be racist. That's what, that's what, and they are fucking allowed to be racist. They've won that yeah. battle. Uh, they're allowed to be racist and be prime minister. So it's... <laughs> and, it's and sexist. Yes, yeah. Bristol, so, you are. So, so they've won. They are, they're allowed to do all these things and no one's stopping them doing those things. But comedy should be able to, you know, you, when you're doing that bit about Jamil, 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 I don't even know how to say her name. Uh, she's, you know, it is, it's like, oh, wow, that's, you know... No, but it's, it's a fucking good point as well that you make about it. So that's what comedy should be. And I, I also think it's about the person saying the thing and whether you like that person. When yeah. someone says something offensive, if, they, if, they, if you like them and, it, and, it's, and it's knocking down the, the right target, they'll get away with it. And if yeah. you don't like them and you think they're a dick, they won't get away with it. You're a very likable performer. So, yeah. Well, I, I, I really abuse that, uh, uh, <laughs> that, uh, uh, that warmth that I have. Um, I, you know, I, I have... I, watched, I grew up watching Michael Barrymore be incredibly warm, and he had that uh, thing that not a lot of people have, um, pre-pool. Um, LAUGHTER <laughs> Uh, but I grew up. I, I was actually on Michael Barrymore's My Kind of People. Were you? Yeah, I did a I did something called freestyle disco dancing in a in a Methodist church in Brentree. Any fans in? <laughs> no. Uh, my auntie owned a dance school, and I uh, I well I I basically did. Why was I saying this? Oh yeah yeah. So our team went to Michael Barrymore's My Kind of People. 
in... Uh, so, you know, it looks like, oh, we've got some local talent. No, that talent got on a fucking coach um, and went all the way to Croydon to the Wycliffe uh, shopping centre to dance. And we met Michael and it was, it, it, it was inspiring to watch someone work a crowd like that. Yeah. It was probably the reason I do what I do because I was... Oh, I think I was probably about 13. Mm -hmm. And I just watched this guy just... Everyone adored him, and he was effortless, and he was so funny and warm and engaging. But also, you you couldn't touch him. He wasn't he wasn't like it was. He was in charge. There was no like there was no two way thing. It was mm -hmm. his room. He was in charge. He was doing his thing, and then he would go off and be on his own. And I I grew up with I grew up watching him, and it's that warmth that you know people like him. Ant and Deck have got that warmth. I uh, I. I think I have as well, um, which is the the um, a, a strength, but also a vulnerable glint in my eye. Mm. And well, it's uh, important you can, you can get away with almost anything, yeah. almost anything, James. Almost anything. Don't let anyone I, die I, in your house. No, no. Or <laughs> <laughs> I'm not having any pool parties, mate. I, um, I, well, I, one of our first jobs with me and Stuart Lee was writing for the pilot episode of that Michael Barrymore show. So Michael Barrymore loved. Uh, Simon Munnery he loved he, he was like he was a big comedy fan he loved Simon Munnery and he tried to get Simon Munnery to write for his ITV pilot in 1991 this would have been right when he was God and Jesus I think he was doing or he was doing maybe the security guard he, was, he wasn't even doing Alan Parker at that point I think it was like very early days and uh, Simon didn't want to do it and so it got passed down to me and Stu who he also liked and he was so nice to us and he was so amazing in that show he didn't end up he would really like we wrote loads of stuff for him and he did it all, you know, in the rehearsals and loved it. And then someone would come down and go, shoo, 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 and then they go, oh, well, that bit's cut now. But he really wanted to do our stuff. And he was so nice to us. I've met him a couple of times since. He's, he's, uh, he's he just, you know, every, you know, that's that thing that's never going to, he's never going to live down. His problem was that he ran. Yeah. Um, and he shouldn't have. And he knows that. And he didn't kill a guy, uh, you know. <laughs> he had a party that got out of hand. I've been to those parties. Um, <laughs> I've seen a lot of stuff. Yeah. And unfortunately, he was just gay at the wrong time and it was a real track tra well it was you know him. at that time he was wasn't out yeah not uh, and that was before out. yeah yeah so and uh, when, when we were working with him his manager his wife was his manager who was fucking out you know it was <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it was this really uh, you know he had these young men hanging around with him as uh, sort of uh, their jobs weren't really explained to us uh, it was <laughs> <laughs> And we were two young, uh, quite attractive men, I guess, as well, hanging around. <laughs> so, I don't know. But he was, he was so charming and so, like, I mean, really brilliant at that audience work. I feel so sorry for him. I met, you know, I met him at a party and he was just so upset by, by what had happened to him, obviously, and to what had happened to, uh, in the whole situation. But like you say, you know, just everywhere I go, you know, that's all I get. Someone came up, made a joke about that to his face. As I was talking, he said, see... So someone was just that was all. That's all he's got for the rest of his life is that. And it's and it's you know it's what show it's where showbiz is terrifying because he really was do no wrong up there superstar could do anything he wanted and Shrek then and then man. never worked you know really never works again always worked very rarely worked, worked again. I've got him on. A, this is a weird sentence. I have Michael Barrymore on a Google alert. Uh, so. Any time his name comes up on the internet, I can see what he's up to. Okay. I, I love him so much. Right. Um, there's, there's something he's doing. Something. There's something that's going to come out. Is he doing something? There's something going to happen. Okay. There's well, good or bad? Are, good. Is good. he planning? Is he planning? Murmur I heard murmurings. Okay. It's time for that, though. I think it's time for where I think because there's this. A uh, whole feeling at the moment where everyone's got to be good, and like I, I say in my show about, you know, you in the nineties, if you tra st if you sh strapped like soft porn to a, a product like tits or something, and people would buy it, you know, that was what the nineties were like. But nowadays, it's like inspirational porn sells stuff. Like you strap a good deed to a product, and people will buy it. And I think it's really opening up a world for um, for for reformed characters who yeah. have been through shit, um, who have who have who've got like a bit of a past, and people are sort of wanting that naughtiness. You know, yeah. and I and and I think that there is definitely a world in which Michael Barrymore could come back if he's got his mental health in check. Yeah, and if he, you know, in a world he could come back and he could be phenomenal again. I really truly believe it. Mm. We'll see. We'll see. I might be wrong. I've got, I mean, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of time for him. I mean, he made it when we were at the part after show party. Literally, none of our material had been in the show. 
<laughs> oh, he, came, yeah. he, made, he came up to, we were both there. We were, I was there, Stu was his girlfriend and she had a friend with her who he assumed was my girlfriend, but she wasn't. But he came up to us and said, stick with these guys, girls, they're going to be big. You know, and there was no need for him to do that and there was no real evidence for him for it. <laughs> that, that was going to be the case. And he didn't but, use a single joke of yours. He didn't. That's great. <laughs> but, but I think it wasn't his, it was literally everyone else's, everyone else's choice. He sort of wanted to push and be a bit more alternative and be, you know, and take risks. And they pulled him back. Even then, he was, he was really under the control of all these people. And he was sort of this naive innocent in the middle of it. And that's why I kind of, I sort of agree with you, you know, about that. I think he deserves another shot. Let's get him on this. Um, He'd do it. He would do it. Yeah, OK, let's get him on this. I should get him back. He's a nice guy. Anyway, let's talk about you. <laughs> we don't have to. Um, so, yeah, well, you were talking about uh, getting into comedy. So you, you were doing this competitive dance stuff. And and then and the, was the drag queen stuff come out of that or was the uh, competitive was... dancing was until I was uh, about seventeen when my mum let me not do it anymore. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I I tried to never go back every week because uh, I was fat and m- made to dance with skinny girls who always won and I I lost for thirteen years. Yeah. I never won a competition. Me and my sister once came second, and I remember it so vividly. I remember how people reacted because I always danced well, but there was this issue about the weight thing because all the people that did well were all skinny, yeah. and I was I wasn't as big as I am now, but I was a chubby kid, and I danced really well so often, and my mum would always get so frustrated, going, "You did brilliantly, you should have placed," and it was a real frustrating thing. But she was very protective of what that meant. She never told me that was because of my weight. There was like a she kept me away from that knowledge. She wanted me to be innocent for a while. But I remember the, the time we came second and the way that people treated me. And I, I remember just thinking, this is amazing. But I also remember thinking, rem- not in the, this sort of eloquent way, I was like, glory hunters. That's what, I, <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I felt like. And I just remember that feeling of the, the way that people looked at you when you won an award or like that you, uh, that you did something well. And people were like, because no one ever told me I was good at dancing until I got second place. But I'd always dance really well anyway. Um, but I stopped doing that 17, did various amateur dramatic things, did uh, John Redgrave, uh, one of the Redgrave family, I think he's like a distant fourth cousin, um, uh, did a, 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 a sort of musical theatre thing here for kids and I yeah. did that with a friend. Um, and, in the uh, Old Vic? Was that, you did some stuff at the Old I did here, I was yeah. here as well, so I did that and then the Old Vic Youth Theatre, yeah. um, I used to do, I put my... I did a show here in the in the in the black box theater called Eclipse um, and it was about the eclipse and it was around <laughs> the time the eclipse happened in 2001 I think um, was it 2001 yeah 98 there's been a few mate there's been a few Tars ice cream 99 if someone said ni- 99 yeah yeah is it 99 um, so in 1999, thank you, you were wrong. Um, <laughs> I did Eclipse here and uh, did a show here. Uh, it was part of the youth theatre, which was amazing. Getting into that was cool yeah. as well, because I sort of applied a few times and never got in. But did, you know, various bits and pieces like that. I remember trying to get into the world of drama or theatre in this city and stand up. And it was very it's very closed off and I felt like if I wasn't squatting with someone I wasn't allowed in so I sort of went off and found my own way uh, I studied drama theatre and media at the University of Glamorgan um, I know famous <laughs> <laughs> and I and it was there I sort of got involved in experimental theatre and I um, uh, did a lot of physical theatre did stuff with the National Dance Company of Wales got Arts Council funding for various projects used to not even use my face for performance. I put a lampshade on my head and did sort of <laughs> performance art uh, as these characters called Mr. and Mrs. Lampshade, which was about, I think it was sort of like a light-hearted look at sort of um, uh, f- a familiar, like family-based abuse, basically, uh, <laughs> to the backing track of Tom Waits um, <laughs> with a drill. Uh, yeah. uh, Does this uh, exist on film? Or can we find I've got, a vi- I've got footage you? of it, oh, yeah, there is footage out. of it. This could be what destroys your career. Yeah, fucking will. There's actually two videos on my YouTube channel from years ago of, of something we made. It all started, we went off to a... There was this Arts Council funding thing that went out and we all went off to this uh, the, a place in the woods in Wales for a week and we made these films and we, uh, the girl I was working with said, go and get some props. And my sister, when she was alive, we went to a, a charity shop and she picked up a lampshade 
and she said, what about this? Because she said, bring some white props. And she said, what about this? And then that was, the, that was how the lampshade thing happened, which is quite a sweet story. Um, but I, yeah, did experimental theatre. I was, I was uh, doing something in that world. And then I saw this girl that I'd met before, and she was, needed someone to be a priest in an inflatable church at music festivals. <laughs> And then I did that for five years. <laughs> five years. I was going to ask you about this. Um, and uh, I did a best of all electric picnic, uh, best of all loads. I did best of all for all of those years. Right. Um, in various weathers. I've married uh, real people at gorgeous weddings where people have been through stuff and they want to have like a ceremony. It's not a real wedding. It's sort of like a fake one. I've done real weddings though. Yeah. Because of this, people like sort of book me as their celebrant. I've done two weddings. Okay. Um, but I've married thousands of people together. I've married people to objects, people to people <laughs> they've just met, um, people who <clears throat> like you charge for the wedding and people have come and have a little half an hour wedding with us. Yeah. And it's like bridesmaids and you get a little dress and. I did that for years. And Sounds then, good. But the hangovers were intense. <laughs> um, it's a lot of uh, it was festivals, so it was in my in my twenties, and then the hangovers got intense, and then the people we stood with started having babies and getting married, and festival life just sort of disappeared. Oh. Um, and then I decided I was living in Wales, and I decided to move to London to pursue stand-up comedy. I had been telling everyone I was a stand-up comedian for two years without doing any comedy whatsoever. <laughs> and then I started getting booked. Right. Because <laughs> someone, my best friend, I had this sort of theory. She was like, if you want to be something, just say you are it. And then people were like, you can't do that with like brain surgery. But you no. Can... <laughs> something like stand-up, you can, I mean, we're all blagging it, to be honest with you. We're all imposters, so you can just be one if you want. Um, and then I, uh, uh, yeah, and then... I just fell into everything, and stand-up was something. I, I there was a there was an advertisement on the uh, internet looking for a host of a show in the Queen of Hoxton in two thousand and eleven, March seventeenth, two thousand and eleven. <laughs> my very first stand-up gig. Right. Um, been on stage, as I said, my whole life, but this was the first stand-up gig. I was fucking awful. There was a ginger guy on who later became my boyfriend, <laughs> and uh, how I brought him on stage is by by going. Um, this next guy's ginger. I fancy gingers. And then I welcomed him on stage. <laughs> Worked? It, I, I mean, it didn't get that. <laughs> you got the ginger, though. You got the ginger out of it. I got the ginger. I, yeah, it, I, yeah I, I mean, it was a, a terribly uh, difficult relationship okay. for both of us. Um, Don't just go for people by their hair colour. That's my... I'm trying. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, go start with that and then work out they've got a nice personality. My, nice. Do you know what my thinking is? with Because I used yeah. to be very attracted to ginger, gin, people with ginger hair. And the reason is, is because I, I'm attracted to people that haven't had an easy life. And okay. immediately... <laughs> immediately when you've got ginger hair, someone somewhere has said shit at you yeah. about your hair colour and you've had to go in your head or <laughs> not. Or, and I, I, I like people... Like, I don't immediately find, you know, like... If someone's like, oh my God, have you seen how good looking they are? There's people in comedy like that and everyone's like, oh my God, they're so good. I, I don't find them good looking. I like people who, I I'm attracted to people who look like they've been through shit, you know? Okay. I, like, I like survivors. It's, like, yeah. it's hot as fuck, isn't it? <laughs> you want to be with someone who could like, who you're going to stand behind in the apocalypse. <laughs> That's what you want. You want you want to be like, I want, and I want someone to feel that way about me. I want like my chat to think like, like, do you know what the most impressive thing I've done? All the comedy shit he doesn't give a shit about. My boyfriend, the most impressive thing I ever did was I am. Um, <laughs> I've never said this before ever. <laughs> uh, we were we were in. The, I lived in this horrible house at Rats in London. It was horrific, and there was this uh, bin at the back, a wheelie bin full of concrete. And that wheelie bin, the only way it could get out of the house is to drag it through the house. And um, he was like, I was like, can you come and help me with this bin? He didn't come quick enough. And I took the concrete bin of bricks all the way through the house. And I, and I picked, and it was, there were stairs. There was like, and I did the whole thing. I basically moved a fridge by myself. Yeah. And he, like, he never banged me as hard <laughs> as he did that day. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Those two are off. That's too much for him. They're off to bang. It's all fucking. Too exciting. 
gets everyone going. I'm going to ask you some emergency questions because um, people will have come out and expect them. And they've got a, I mean, uh, you know, some people were here last week as well and they didn't get any. <laughs> they've come back at the hope there will be one. I have asked you some in Edinburgh, so I've got to be careful I don't ask you the same one again. So I'm going to go somewhere random. Um, uh, uh. <laughs> All right, this, I get, I'm quite obsessed with uh, what you can get away with uh, about cheating on people. Here's a whole page about it. Uh, if you have sex with a Frankenstein, are you cheating on your partner? Because uh, it's like... Um, I don't really know what my ex well, explanation... Because there's, no, there's no soul in it? There's no soul. It's made up of different body parts. It's not really a person. I mean, I, it's like a bit of like a sort of human robot, isn't it? It's like a kebab or something. <laughs> If you are fucking Frankenstein, I think yeah. the person who feels cheated on is going to have more issues with you than you're cheating. <laughs> um, the, 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 um, the necrophilia would yeah. be a major issue for I mean, me. But it's back alive again, so it's, you know, it's, it's the best of both worlds. It's dead and alive. You can feel part. like it's necrophilia, but then, you know, none of the stigma. <laughs> Answered. That's done. Okay. And, all right, a subsidiary question. What if part of the Frankenstein is taken from your partner so you would actually be having sex? Say their leg or their, one of their kidneys or something. Was your partner still alive? And just a bit of your partner had fallen off, they'd stuck that in the Frankenstein. You could argue that you were just having sex with your partner then, can you? This is like an episode of Doctor Who at the end where um, Rose gets given another doctor that okay. is able to stay with her in age. Okay. And then I was like, because loads of people were like, oh, isn't that great? Rose gets to stay with David Tennant because I, I was only watching it for him. Um, I, I've got a real thing. Um, oh, Rose is staying with David Tennant. That's great. And I was fucking furious because there was still a doctor that was left without someone. So yes, it is cheating. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Some who nerds in. Well All right. Done. Well, then this is a, a subsidiary question which we don't need because that you will have already answered. But is it cheating to have sex with someone who has had an organ donated to them by your partner, or is it your duty? <laughs> <laughs> Would I? I mean, like, if your partner had died, and then his heart went yeah, to and someone his heart, else. You know, a couple of his eye, irises were in there. Cock, his cock could be on there. Here's a better question. Yeah. How much of your other partner needs to be in another person for it to become your other partner? Okay, that's a it's good the question. same question that I have about crumbs and biscuits. Okay. <laughs> How big does a crumb have to be before it becomes a biscuit that's again? That's a good question. <laughs> they come to me for the big stuff, Richard. It's good. It's good to have. Let me see if there's. Let me see if there's a classic one. I can't. I've already asked your ham hand and uh, some arm cream uh, uh, armpit. Do you remember me asking? Oh you yeah, you asked me that. That's I... in Edinburgh. Listen to the Edinburgh Fringe podcast. You'll be able to hear that. Uh, Jade is a returning guest. Um, would you rather have a tit that dispenses talcum powder or a finger that can travel through time? I don't believe I asked you that before. Does, my, like... does my rest of my body go with my finger? No, your finger goes through the portal. You can still control it, but your finger is now in a different time. In the same space, possibly, but um, we haven't got into that. Uh, but you could look through and just be able to see what you're doing to give yourself a chance. But you could do, you could affect the future or the past, the What's past or the future. Not that, I mean, or the present, but you can do that anyway. <laughs> or a tit that dispenses talcum powder. You get all the talcum powder you want out of your tit. I mean, as a fat girl, talcum yeah. powder is a great uh, asset to any gr fat girl's handbag. Okay. Um, but I, do you know what? A yeah. finger travelling through time... Yeah. That was that's great because also it means in this accent I get to say finger three times. Now. <laughs> um, but also the stuff you could do, like you could fuck up Beethoven's uh, <laughs> symphony, yeah, by like poking through, and then he's like going mad, and then you just go, Ping, and then he never he doesn't ever write it because someone's yeah. like, well it was great until that fucking bit there, mate. <laughs> good, it's a good use. One more. Time flies by so fast. Um, I'm not going to ask you. I'm going, I'm going early, but I'm going to ask you that. I won't ask you if you've ever tried to suck your own cock. Yes. <laughs> you, I answered this backstage, but I didn't get a full answer, so I'm going to ask it because you answered a different question. Have you ever seen a ghost? Yes. Now, tell me about your, the ghost you saw. Now, before I say this, some people believe, some people do not. Yeah, I do I not believe. I'm agnostic. I'm open to the concept of believing in whatever. Okay. But I, I, I do like a bit of proof. You know, just a, just a bit. I don't have blind faith. Uh, I saw a ghost in my own bedroom when I was a kid. 
Uh, it was a man in an anorak walking towards me, which isn't a garment you often see on ghosts. I am a punk, even when I'm hallucinating. But he was wearing an anorak, and yeah. he was walking towards me, and he was pointing, and then I screamed at him, and he puffed away. Right. Poof, like that. Um, and... So my boyfriend and I like to shit ourselves up quite a bit. Like we, re- do you know what we, do you know what we did? We, we had this day off. We he hadn't watched it, the new stuff. Oh, yeah. Which if you haven't seen it, it's fu- if you like horror, it's fucking brilliant. So we watched the first one at home, and I made like tacos, and then we got in a car and we went and watched it too, 4D. Holy shit! Things touch your ankles from underneath the seat. You get. So scary shit happens and they blow air into your ears and you get shaken around. There's a bit where like water sprays on you. Like the smell of shit, like not shit, but the smell of stuff (laughs) happens in the room. And I screamed all the way through. I couldn't help it. I tried to like imagine there were other people in the room who wanted to just watch the show. But I was, I couldn't believe it. And then this woman at the end came up to me and Rich and went, the most entertaining thing about that entire show was your reaction. <laughs> I mean, four dimensions is actually time. So you, you're travelling in time. The fourth dimension is time. So if it's in 4D, then it should, went, should have come out in a different time zone than you I went went to in. the year 3000. It's all busted. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I... So uh, we love to shit ourselves up. Yeah. We drove. So we, like drove to the Enfield house where the Enfield hauntings happened. And we like, because the the house number's not on the internet, so we looked at the house and then we found it. And then we were like sat outside in our, uh, in our like Citroen. (laughs) (laughs) We sat there and just stared at the window for ages. And we were like, should we go over to the house? Like, people live in that house. Like, like you lot, normal people live in the Enfield house. Not like, we just sat there waiting. And we were there for so long that we both uh, well, I went, the curtain twitched, and then he said, yes, it did. It didn't twitch. And then, and then we saw together the other curtain twitch, screamed, and then ran off, and it was exhilarating. Um, and it was someone just looking out the curtain to see what you were doing in the garden. T- uh, a family wondering why there yeah. was a white citron outside of their house, yeah. staring at it, which I'm sure they're probably used they to as well. To, yeah. But we love to... I, I used to be terrified of stuff when I was growing up, like... My brother used to play this really nasty game with me. I don't know if I said this to you. Uh, so. No. My brother is an electrician. He's normal. He doesn't need this. He, um, he, uh, he, he's 10 years older than me. So when I was eight, he was 18. And um, he used to play a game which was called Guess the Film. So he'd put a VHS in. And you'd think like he'd put something on sort of fun, you know, like a little Christmas jolly or... He'd put on Alien and it would be the face-hugging scene um, where he, like, lays eggs inside of him and he would put that bit on and then I would have to watch it and then I would have to guess the film, but I would have, like, absolute terror nightmares. Like, I I couldn't watch The Incredible Hulk when I was growing up, but now I'm in a nice relationship. There's a sort of safety that I have and so now I'm like, I can only watch them with him because he... He's there and he's... I feel safe with him, but... I, it just means now that I've, I'm catching up on all this stuff. Right. And, like, he, he's shown me Thing. You know, the, the, the Thing? The, is it Thing? With the head yeah, yeah. and the legs coming out of the fucking ears and, like, it all, like, all the, like, the snot and shit like that. Yeah. And, you know, the, 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 the thing that comes off of the... The film Thing! I can only think of, the, I can only think of that thing. You know, the... He- thing. the, the with the... Um, you got to be fucking kidding me. That scene... Well, he's like, so I'm, so I'm catching up on all this I wicked... I think your boyfriend's just been filming a load of uh, stuff <laughs> telling you it's... Plasticine, yeah. that he's like, yeah. turns into... But he, um, yeah, well, I'm catching up on all this yeah, great yeah. horror and stuff, but it's nice to, it's not, it's nice to shit yourself up in it. I love yeah. it. Get, you know, screaming and you don't... You know, I love it. Yeah. It's great. Then life becomes terrifying. I have some kids, then life becomes really terrifying. Yeah. Oh, this... All the time. You don't need it anymore. Just you imagine all the ways your children could be hurt. <laughs> The privilege of not having children, I don't think it's spoken about enough. I've got a real, like, you know, I can be all, like, skippity-dip down into town and do what I like and yeah. go and see horror movies and, and then, um, and, and because there's no kids there. I, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I, sorry, I, I don't have them. I didn't check my privilege don't, before I... Don't have sex again, just in case that's how it happens. Oh, I've got stuff up there, yeah, mate. Bit, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm, can not find... into, I'm not into that whole medicine thing because I think the government are trying to put things in my womb. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm fertile. Uh, I um, I just know it. Look at me. I, I look like I'd be a great mother. So that I I I've, I've suspicions. Um, <laughs> hips. And uh, so I I I got stuff I got stuff put up there, yeah, mate. Ain't, ain't no, nothing getting through that. Mine can get through anything. <laughs> They'll just, gnaw their way, they'll, gnaw, they'll just gnaw their way through whatever that is. Should I tell you whatever what's... that chastity Iron Maiden belt is in there. What, straight through? They'll just they'll nibble through. It's not t- there'll be a few that get taken out that, in the you know, like they'll, they'll, they give their lives to the brothers behind. <laughs> but bang. Come on, buddy. And then it's just one. Hop yeah, over. Hop, hop over. Use There's... Um, my mother, yeah. after my sister, wasn't going to have any more children and she had uh, a coil fitted, Grim. Um, and... She got this knock at the door. My sister was probably uh, 18 months old and this woman knocked at my mum's door in 1983 to try and sell... She was a, a gypsy and she tried to sell my mum Heather from her own garden. And, um, <laughs> and she knocked at the door. And my mum used to tell me this story when I was younger. She'd knock at the door and, and uh, she knocked at the door just once and she told my mum her fortune. And she said a load of stuff to my mum that she was going like, to go through a terrible sadness and... And then there was, um, and then my sister walk, uh, like told, uh, walked around the corner as a little baby mum picked her up and apparently this woman looked at her and my mum said, you know, she thinks that she saw something and that my sister was going to die. And then, my, and then the, 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 the woman said to my mother, she said, you're going to have another daughter, you are. And she went, no, I'm not. And she went, you are. Um, just to let you know, this isn't my natural hair. Um, I wasn't born with this David Bowie look. I'm naturally blonde. And the woman said to my mum, she said, you're going to have another daughter. She's going to be blonde and everyone's going to know her name, is what she said to my mum in 1983. And then mum was like, no, you're, you're, you know, I've had, I've had the coil fitted. And then lo and behold, I come out old in it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's almost this feeling that I have, uh, some, that, you know, like, because my sister was always sort of a bit of a sickly child and stuff. There was almost like, I was... I was sort of, but I think there's a story about that, you know, like a, a kid that's been born for for the purposes of helping. I went to see. Do you know Bryony Kimmings? Yeah, I do. Yes, I went I to see her fabulous show. If you get, if you haven't seen it, it's fa- so the. F- f- I'm a phoenix bitch. Yeah. And it's about her dealing with her son being born and having this um this disease and and uh, he's, he's 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 doing really well. He's great, but it was a really hard first year for her, and it's an incredibly powerful show. And afterwards, I was like all kinds of ridiculously, I was, I was crying my fucking eyes out. I couldn't stop. Oh, I was like this at her at the bar, which is really annoying. Um, <laughs> and I was, I, was like, I was like this at her. And then I just said to her, I was like, I just think like how, how my mother has gone through this. How did you, how did you fucking cope with your kids and stuff? I think about my own mother. Like how has she coped with losing a kid? And Bryony said to me, because she had you. And it, and I and that feel and sometimes it feels it feels like the, the the gypsy turned up to try and like trip my mum out of money and like told her something I don't know I yeah. I don't know if I believe in stuff but sometimes it's just nice and I think comforting to believe in things I think everything's entirely very cynical and maybe you know a little bit of belief as long as you don't like have to like sign up to cults and like get rid of your house and <laughs> you know there's no priests fiddling kids and shit like that but I think that a bit of spirituality and faith is a nice thing for the yeah. soul. Well, you've got to get through that you know the, the things you fit you know you waste so much of your life fearing the, those sort of things it's ridiculous really because you know you, you you get all the feelings and then it either it won't happen or it does happen but it doesn't make a difference either way you're gonna have to experience it so it's it's, it's a horrible thing but it's so you know it, it did obviously you were very close to your sister yeah well we were i will say this like it's a romantic story that i lost my sister but if you've got sisters you know how we got on like <laughs> Like, she's the only person in the world I've punched. Yeah. Square in the fucking face as well. And she deserved it every single knuckle she got. Um, she was two years older than me, and we fought, and we loved each other, and we fought. And I didn't have, like... I, you know, I, I, I wrote a show about it. I wrote a, a, a sort of, you know, the, in comedy, Dead Dad show or Dead Sister show. And I did a Dead Sister show, very cynically. But the show wasn't about, like... It was a it was a complicated story about two sisters who fought and were chalk and cheese and and how I was in her limelight my whole life because she was the better dancer and she was she was just a, a, a far more interesting person when I was growing up because I was like loud and I had no uh, I had no filter and people don't want to be around that when you're a kid but when you get older and you know it's now now I can make a living from it. Um, <laughs> 
but you know it's a, it's a complicated uh, relationship I had with her and yeah. and I uh, it drives my mother mad because she'd love for me to talk about all the kind things my sister did but that's not funny uh, like you know she you just get fingered a lot and you know she <laughs> she had boyfriends and she had drama and yeah. she, she um she once hit a boy in the uh, boy in Redcliffe school was bully, bullying me and he hit me in the stomach with a hockey stick. And then Jenna heard about it, because we were like Phil and Grant at school. <laughs> I was Phil, she was Grant, she fucking comes storming down through the playground. And they start having a scrap. Headmaster takes us away. And then uh, we're in the toilet. I'm sure I've told this story before, but fuck it, it's really great. Um, she's like, let's go to the toilet. So the two of us go off to the toilet. And she's like, punch me in the face. And I went, what? She would punch me in the face. I haven't got a mark. He's hit me and it hasn't marked. You'll get in trouble if you punch me in the face. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not fucking punching you in the face. Are you, are you fucking crazy, you lunatic? I'm not punching you in the face. She got down on her knees and punched her own f- fucking face in the doorknob. <laughs> gave her... She, oh, just fuck, I love it. And then, and then we went in and he got in so much trouble. He got suspended. <laughs> It'll... bloody stories mate yeah, they're yeah. fun they're really yeah. fun I'm I'm so lucky to have like you know when people grandparents and stuff die it's really sad but you're always like oh you know grandma gave me apple pie unless you're like my mum's mum that's another story um, <laughs> <laughs> but like with her you know it was I sort of I'm lucky in the fact that I lost uh, I'm unlucky that I lost a sister but if I look at it positively I'm lucky because I've got all these incredibly funny um, stories to remember her by, and she can't fuck up anymore as well. So she's, <laughs> she, they sort of they ended at twenty seven, and those are the best years of your life, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but it, it gave you like I, I don't know. It, 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 uh, this Robin Ince's book is uh, is great about comedians, and uh, and he sort of argues that most comedians have been through some trauma in some some way. Do you think that was one of the things that pushed you? towards becoming a comedian? It's yeah, well, I think everyone's got trauma. Yeah. Everyone, you can't speak to anyone. Every single person in this room's had a traumatic event happen in their life. If you haven't, you're I'm probably quite basic. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, everyone's got a, a form of trauma. It's just comedians, uh, you know, they, they, there's, a, there's a, a, a side of narcissism with that trauma <laughs> as well. Like some people yeah. can go in on themselves with trauma and, it, and they never mend and they never, and they never fix themselves from it but I also had this I'd already been doing stuff beforehand so I had this drive to I'd already been on stage in front of people so I had that thing that I wanted to do but her dying did a really uncomfortable thing which was it released me from this idea that there was already this person that was so much better at everything than me and then she died and then I was like and I I, I've said this before but I (laughs) it was like that moment in in um, Legally Blonde where she uh, she goes me, <laughs> um, but there, there's a really uncomfortable conversation about it all. But she, she, you know, she was a, she actually probably wouldn't have ever been a performer. She just liked being in relationships and getting married, and she got married and stuff, and that was the thing that she liked to have done. But there was always a feeling that I was never going to be as good as my sister because she was so popular at school and all the. But like, I'm, I mean, the, the day I lost my virginity. The fucking the two lads, not two. At the, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> one lad did it, but two were over the house, and the other one went up to my sister's room to like. I don't know, go through her knicker drawer or something. So even that moment of your life where you lose virginity is laced with, well, lacy pants, no, yeah. is laced with, with her in it as well. So I, yeah. the, the show I did was all about the sort of, the ima- it was every story that was about me had her all the way through it. And, sure. and you know, that's a beautiful thing I have now in her, in her death that she is, she's like yesterday in the, um, the, pre, the, the Amazon Prime special, we do a pre-credits show. I mean, none of the other Prime specials have done this at all. I've bloody done it. Um, you know, they do, you know, in some of the stand-up shows, they do like a, pre, a pre-bit. Um, and uh, 
So the whole show is me getting rid of all the, the gowns and the songs and everything and stripping back to a black turtleneck to, to talk about something I'm passionate about. But obviously a worldwide audience haven't seen that side of me. So you hear me singing down the corridor mm -hmm. and you come to my door and I'm in a feathered gown and they, and they knock on the door. But on my, um, my dressing table, um, I put a picture of her on it and she's just, you know, peppered through all of my, all of my things. And my dad said to me last night and... I'm trying really hard not to cry on this podcast because I'll be honest with you, I've cried on seven and <laughs> and I've got to fucking stop doing this, but it might happen and I'm not going to apologise for it. But my dad said to me yesterday, we, were in a, we had a little after party. I, we went to the Phoenix Arts, Cl Arts Club after and everyone came and um, it was a really nice night. I mean, it's like, a, it's, I don't know if you're married. You're married. You're married. You're married. You're married. You had a married, married day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mar wedding days are tough because you don't relax. You have to yeah. talk to everyone for three minutes and then move on. To the, I had that last night. Uh, but my dad sat next to me and he, he sort of leant over and he went, he, he said, he said, your sister it would be really proud. And, it, and, it, and I went, and she would be fucking jealous. <laughs> 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 uh, well, and I think, but it's also as comedians, I think we we tackle dark subjects with jokes, and that's the way we get through it. And, yeah. But I think that's the way most people get through everything. Everything, yeah, it's the only I, way. You know, but I, I wonder whether the world we're living in is is getting too sensitive to that to that sort of thing. We're rather like... than the rather than the we can't say anything. It's worrying about offending people. Some people will be upset and offended that you could joke about the death of a sister because they go, my sister's dead. I didn't find it funny. Uh, and, <laughs> and I didn't get a show out of it. Why does everyone love Jane? Uh, Such a good impression. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but, so, but the, it will help more people, you know. And so what, what, that's the thing, you know, you talking about this and you being funny about it and, and, and finding the humour in something dark and, and finding the love in something dark as well is, is going to help more people. But if someone gets upset by it, do, you, do we have to not do that? No, thing, I think know? that we're all... We're, I, I, I don't believe getting upset about something is the worst thing to happen to anyone in the no. world. I watched my sister die. That was pretty horrific. Um, me getting upset about something is not the worst thing. Yeah, in that moment, I'm, I'm like, oh, it's the worst thing ever, but it's not, you know? It just... I, I talk about confidence in my new show and how, you know, in order to achieve confidence, you've got to go through stuff and come out the other side stronger. You can't go around it. You can't cancel stuff because it doesn't, it doesn't suit you. you, you like, and we're, I think there's a sort of an encouragement in, in the world right now where we're able to just, like, if you don't like something, you get rid of it. Now, I don't... I... I on my sort of Twitter feed. I mute other comedians mainly because it hurts when I see other people doing well, as you would naturally. Um, if you're not having a good time and then everyone's like, I'm doing this, because they're all, they're all sort of advertising themselves for you guys to come to shows. But sometimes when you're another comic who's not buying their tickets, it hurts. So, but the people I don't mute, I don't, I, I, I don't, I, the people I don't mute are people that say stuff I disagree with. Because... I have to listen to things that I disagree with because it makes me make my point stronger. And also, it's funny as well. People say mad shit all the time. I want to see it. I want to see people saying crazy shit, you know? Yeah. Um, I have got, um, I have got a, a certain um, American president on mute, um, but it's not him. I've got the name of him on mute. Okay. Um, <laughs> just because... It's just, it's, everything's been said about him, you know. That's, I've got certain words. Uh, the words I have on mute are... Um, shall I read them to you? Yeah. <laughs> this is funny, actually. Um, I, uh, hang on, let's do it. Because it's just, you know, like, it's, a bit, it's just a bit of self-preservation, but it's, it's that whole, um, you know, getting, getting rid of stuff that's difficult. But I think that, you know, if something upsets you, it's not, it's not going to upset you forever. Well, you hear it once, and then it, and you get stronger with it. Um, sorry, privacy and safety. No, 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 that's not it, is it? You can mute stuff, by the way. I don't know if I'm bringing this up to you, up to you for the first time, but if you... Um, so, account, here we go. Security. Oh, for fuck's sake, this is not great. Um, we can wait. It's we okay. can wait. You can just sit we there for a minute. Out. You can just edit everything. Yeah. That guy might come back in a minute. Muted. Here we are. Okay. Here's my muted words. Oh, God. <laughs> Brexit. Uh, Corbyn. <laughs> Donald Trump, football. <laughs> Queen, spelt with a KW. <laughs> May, not because I hate the month. Patriarchy, it's gone. <laughs> Petition, 
The sentence, please sign this. <laughs> um, Russell Brand. <laughs> and then the last five are variations of the sentence, Yas Queen. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Yas Queen, Yas Queen, Yas Queen, Yas Queen, and Yes Queen. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of people, like, you know, I don't think it's a healthy option to just... Because you couldn't go up to someone in the street who said something you didn't like and go, mute. You, <laughs> you have to... I think... I took, you know, we're the furthest generation away from war and there's a load of people that are older than us that, are, you know, survived some pretty horrific situations and they were fine. Like, we can survive people saying mean shit to us, you know? And, and these people very quickly find themselves not being a very popular person anyway. You know, you're not, you're not going to win anything by getting someone cancelled on the internet. You know, these people have to live with themselves every day. You've already won. And, and I just, I think that I talk about tough subjects like that. And I think it does help. It does help because it makes people feel, maybe it makes people feel like a little bit more connected to something, but yeah. I, I, I don't like the world in which I uh, see people being sort of cancelled a lot. Uh, I don't, I don't, it makes me really uncomfortable that people feel like they have power over what I say, because yeah. you don't, you don't fucking have any power over the words that come out of my mouth, no matter how much you might not like them, you have no power there. Um, and that is a hard thing for people to understand, because they, we've given everyone the ability to control things that are coming at them but i'll tell you a little i i worked out the amount of people that are on twitter in the world seven billion people on the planet and more um there are 1.64 percent of people in the world are actually on twitter and that's active and non-active users so essentially the stuff you see on social media doesn't <laughs> fucking matter yeah and and i you know i i like comedy I, I love comedy. It's, you know, it's, it, and people say things that are naughty and laughing at it, and I love it. It's, <laughs> I love a guilty pleasure, and I, <clears throat> you know, I think that the types of people that want to cancel shit, like, you know, just go yeah. and throw yourself in the fucking sea, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think it's going to change. Like, you know, people still want to laugh. You know, it's, it's finding that what the thing is, and you know, that that changes. There's the, the the tastes of what's acceptable and what's unacceptable change, but it changes so naughtiness often. doesn't. Yeah, but the actual naughtiness doesn't. An understanding where where what's naughty and what's offensive. Well, it, that's the problem, isn't it? There's a thing. There's so many lines being drawn. It means the people that are absolute knobheads, the absolute cunts of the entire world, get away with stuff because those edges get so blurred, yeah. and you don't know where right and wrong is. So actually. Well, whilst we're all saying this person has done this, I, I saw it with a comedian yesterday on the internet. Uh, London Hughes did yeah. a, a Guardian article, which people have taken offence to, and she was getting cancelled by so many people on the internet for having an opinion that she put... You know, the Guardian are the people that fucking wrote it. Yeah. And she and she and I, I, just, I just don't think it's nice to do that to, like, people who aren't murderers, who aren't paedophiles who are like these are just people that have said something like it doesn't matter like people say stuff all the time yeah. and I you know the, I, I, I suppose it comes from a privilege of a way of going through a really horrific experience and knowing that you know that old sentence your parents say to you which is sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt me names can't hurt me I get called a fat C-U-N-T out of fiestas all the bloody time I'm still stood up <laughs> it's fine. I, I, you know, I, 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 people might disagree with this, but I, um, it's a, it's such a, it's a, it's, it's just weird that we we're so far away from from any real world catastrophe, and we're heading towards one with climate change, and everyone's not ready for it. Everyone, there's all load. We haven't made soldiers. We've made a load of people going. Well, I don't like that. Let's get rid of it. <laughs> like you know, <laughs> when war comes, mate. You're fucked. I mean, I'm fucked. I can't run, but. Um, <laughs> I ain't running from a tsunami, mate. I'll just be like, come for me, glass. <laughs> uh, well, Jane, it's been lovely to talk to you again. And, uh, like, you know, Bristol's the best, isn't it? Bristol's so it's fab. Good. I'm Bristol here. People are great. Um, April 26th, I'm in this room. Yeah. Uh, for the first time in my career. It's amazing to... Because um, that's the thing. Like, you look at these venues when you're a kid and you're like, one day I'll be there and I'm here. Um, on the 26th of April doing the... You're band. here now as well, you know. Yeah, I'm here right now. Yeah. <laughs> 
you're there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do come and see Jay Joe, and I'm sure it'll be on tour as well. She's absolutely fantastic, and Bristol should be very proud of her as well, you fuckers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jay <laughs> 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 How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>